Okay, welcome. My name is Elizabeth Thompson. I'm at the American University in Washington, DC. And my co-host today is Yang Zhang, also a professor at the School of International Service. We welcome you on behalf of the um, uh, School of International Service Historical International Studies Cluster, as well as our Anti-Racism Center to the fourth event in our series this spring on new research concerning race and international history. I am so pleased to introduce to you our distinguished speaker, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, who grew up in rural Oklahoma, a child of tenant, a tenant farming family. After moving to California, she studied history and received her BA at San Francisco State College and an MA and a PhD in history at UCLA, as well as an MFA in creative writing and diploma in international and comparative law of human rights. That was just the beginning or maybe the middle of a very long and distinguished career as a scholar activist. Dr. dunbar Tees is a veteran of the 60s revolution. She organized against the US war in Vietnam US imperialism, racism, South African apartheid, uh, workers' rights, women's liberation, and especially the res restoration of indiv indigenous people's participation in uh, United Nations fora. She received the 2017 Lannan Cultural Freedom Prize. As a historian, writer, and professor emeritus at California State University, Dr. Dunbar Ortiz is author and editor of 15 books, including The Great Sioux Nation, Indians of the Americas, Roots of Resistance, the award-winning An Indigenous People's History of the United States, Loaded, A Disarming History of the Second Amendment, and a historical memoir trilogy, Red Dirt, Growing Up Oki, Outlaw Woman, a Memoir of the War Years, 1960 to 1975, Blood on the Border, A Memoir of the Contra War. Dr. Dunmore Ortiz's forthcoming book and the subject of her talk today is Not a Nation of Immigrants, Settler Colonialism, White Supremacy, and a History of Erasure and Exclusion, which will be published in August, 2021. I cannot think of a more important and pivotal moment to have Dr. Dunbar Ortiz join us at American University uh, as we are dealing with the, and reckoning with the long history and neglect of violence done to our neighbors, friends, brothers and sisters of color in our country and beyond our borders. We are facing now, even as the pandemic seems to be turning a corner, even as spring blooms, and even as a new administration has taken power, a new crisis on our border and a renewed uh, uh, concern with the uh, issues that riled our country and brought many protests across every state uh, last summer concerning the case of George Floyd in Minneapolis, as well as now a renewed attention and uh, mourning for our Asian brothers and sisters who have been uh, targeted with violence and even death recently. I must say as well, it is so opportune to have Dr. Dunbar Ortiz with us today because tomorrow she appears in a new film uh, premiering on HBO by Raul Peck who made a I Am Not Your Negro, the highly regarded documentary about James Baldwin. This is Exterminate All the Brutes a documentary on worldwide racism and colonialism. I urge you to uh, view that uh, series. I think it's a four part series, right? Um, beginning tomorrow. But for now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. Thank you, Elizabeth. I want to thank the co-organizers co of this uh, really important lecture series uh, Professor Elizabeth Thompson and Professor Young Chung for inviting me uh, to be a part of the series and to speak today. Well, there's a um, strategic blind spot um, 
that is created by thinking of the United States as a nation of immigrants. Seeing racialized slavery and settler colonialism with its agenda of elimination of the native nations. The concept also normalizes United States imperialism as foreign policy. However, US global expansion was not accidental nor a matter of policy, but the direct outcome of the careful planning and trajectory of the elite founders of the settler state of the United States. Settler colonialism, the ideology of white nativism and US imperialist wars have shaped both immigration policy and immigrant identity. Settler colonialism is more than a colonial structure that developed and replicated itself over time in the 170 years of British colonization in North America that preceded the founding of the United States. The founders of the United States were British citizens being restrained by their monarch from expanding the 13 colonies to further enrich themselves and take more native land. They were British imperialists who visualized the conquest of the continent and achieving access to and dom domination of the Pacific and in particular China. Achieving that goal required conquest of the continent with active settler participation. The settlers being rewarded with land, which was their definition of liberty. As historian Charles Sellers wrote about the settlers, cheap land held absolutely under the seaboard markets capitalist conception of property swelled patriarchal honor to heroic dimensions in rural America. The father's authority rested on his legal title to the family land. Where European peasant holdings, land holdings were usually encumbered with obligations to some elite, the American far farmer held in fee simple. Supreme in his domain, he was beyond interference by any earthly power. He owed no obligations of labor, money, service, or religious fealty to any person or entity. Fee simple land, the augmenting theater of the patriarchal persona sustained his honor and untrammeled will. The British secessionists who founded the United States devised a unique plan in the 1787 Northwest Ordinance which was created during the War of Secession by the Continental Congress and was reenacted by the US Congress in 1789. Its provisions were borrowed in part from the British colonial system of settler colonialism in Ulster, Ireland and the 13 North American colonies. However, the secessionist intervention was something new the constitutional construction of the fiscal military settler state, a settler republic with both ethnic cleansing of the native presence and chattel slavery producing racial capitalism. The Northwest Land Ordinance provided for eventual settler self-government once Euro-American settlers outnumbered the indigenous population. The Land Act guaranteed to the settlers property acquisition, civil rights, religious freedom, trial by jury, representational legislation, and public education. That ultimate conclusion, however, was preceded by successive stages of colonization from military ethnic cleansing to the indigenous of the indigenous inhabitants to a federally appointed territorial government to a semi-representational government to finally admission into the United States as a state. 
This constituted a unit of the fiscal military nation state. Historian Howard Lamar observed that apologists for US expansionism do not see the ordinance as a reflection of colonialism, but rather a means of reconciling the problem of liberty with the problem of empire. Through the Northwest Land Ordinance, the United States created a unique land system among colonial powers, including Britain. In the US system, land itself, not just what was produced on the land, agriculture, mining, logging, grazing, and so on, was the most important exchange commodity for the accumulation of capital and building the national treasury, real estate. Although private property and land had long been a fact of life in Europe and other parts of the world, it was demarcated by the contour of streams, rivers, tree lines, rock formations, mountains, and private property was reserved for the economic and political elite. In the United States, every man a king. It created something new under the sun the Platt system of privatizing the indigenous commonly owned land into marketable units. The Northwest Land Ordinance spawned the public land survey system, a unique sur surveying method to plat, that is divide land, transforming forming it into property for sale and settling. Plots of 160 acres with sections of four plots of 640 acres. As the US took more land with the Louisiana Purchase, the Oregon Territory and half of Mexico, the government promised free land to Europeans and Euro-Americans for the purpose of recruiting and motivating settlers to squat on indigenous people's lands, appropriating their cultivated fields and village infrastructures while violently driving out the inhabitants. When the indigenous farmers resisted, settlers would call on state militias or the army to finish the job. The pieces of paper or deeds representing units of land made up the commodity market that built the United States capitalist system and remains its central factor today. The first US corporation established by the Continental Congress in, 19, in 1777 was the Springfield Arms Factory in Western Massachusetts, manufacturing guns. The other main commodity until 1860 was human, the enslaved African body with its deed of sale on the stock market. Historian Donald Harmon Atkinson aptly describes the implementation of the land ordinance, writing, it did not deal with concepts such as pursuit of happiness, but instead declared in practical terms how the land from the Appalachian Mountains up to the Mississippi River was to be conquered. This was to be done by surveyors chains each 22 yards in length. The measuring began at an arbitrary point in the Ohio Territory and invisible lines were drawn on the land to form a grid of perfect rectangles marked by cairns, iron bars, and the occasional brass plate cemented onto a masonry base. Each of the rectangles had its own map reference and as the US Imperium expanded, the grid eventually reached the Pacific coast and stretched between Mexico and British North America. The lines on the land not only conquered national topography, natural topography, but also made possible the liberation of parcels of land from their previous occupants and their efficient allocation to newcomers. From the beginning of the surveys in the newly claimed Northwest Territory to the Pacific Ocean, 
the lands claimed by the surveys were already populated with indigenous peoples, but the land was treated, treated as terra nullis, unpopulated land. While the indigenous nations and communities were reduced in numbers by genocidal warfare that caused displacement, starvation, crowded refugee situations, and resultant infectious diseases with catastrophic death tolls. It was the implementation of the fiscal military state. The state made for war against the indigenous inhabitants in order to appropriate land and make it marketable. But native nations fiercely resisted and it took 100 years of colonialist wars across the continent to incarcerate the survivors on reservations that constituted their remaining land bases. The old Northwest Territory was the initial site of genocidal policy enacted by the founders of the United States. Kentucky is the crucible. By the time of secession, British settlers and armed white citizen militias had accumulated 170 years of experience in ethnically cleansing and dominating the 13 colonies. Emplo employing this intergenerationally practiced unlimited war against civilians and their resources, the government and settlers intensified and accelerated those practices in the invasion and conquest of the Ohio country, Northwest Territory, that comprised the future states of Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota from 1787 to 1832. The genocidal campaigns carried out by the new US Army were resisted by, a confederation, by confederations of indigenous nations. But by 1803, ethnically cleansed Ohio became a state, followed by Indiana 13 years later, the others following. But it took decades. In the next period of the US conquest, the army under Andrew Jackson carried, carried out the genocidal wars in the South against the Muscogees and Cherokees and into Spanish Florida where the US Marines and army mounted three major wars from land and sea against the Seminole nation between 1816 and 1858 albeit without succeeding in ever removing the Sem Seminole people as a whole. And when Jackson was president in the 1830s, he ordered and the army carried out Thomas Jefferson's plan, the former forced removal of all the native nations from east of the Mississippi to designated Indian territory, Oklahoma, which was um, obtained under the Louisiana Purchase. The secessionist British founders of the United States were unapologetic imperialists. British imperialist secessionists, but with added, the added conceit of an empire for liberty as Thomas Jefferson conceived the future. Historian David Reynolds writes that Jefferson believed the US empire was destined to assume the responsibility to spread freedom around the world, starting with the North American continent and intervening abroad. US foreign policy was stamped with this concept and since then has provided the ideological motivation and rationalization for all US wars and interventions. The elephant in the room of US immigration policy is the US-Mexico border that was created by the United States military invasion and annexation of half of Mexican territory, 1846 to 1848. The US project to reach the Pacific with access to China began in 1806 with a US military spy mission led by Lieutenant Zebulon Montgomery Pike Jr. 
that illegally entered Mexico, which was at the time still a colony of Spain. This spy mission in preparation to annex Mexico in order for the US to reach the Pacific took place just before the Mexican people initiated their successful war of liberation, which took 10 years. For most US historians, the United States invasion and colonization of the Spanish territories of Cuba, Puerto Rico, and the Philippines and Guam in the late 1890s mark the era of United States imperialism, which they portray as a period, not a persistent reality from the nation's founding and continuing into the 21st century. U.S. historians traditionally have used euphemisms such as expansion or the moving frontier or manifest destiny rather than continental imperialism to describe the three decade process that culminated in the annexation of half of Mexico and the launching of genocidal wars against the indigenous nations in that territory. President Thomas Jefferson was sending Marines and warships to North Africa in the so-called Barbary Wars while sending military spy missions to the Spanish colony of Mexico where the Mexican people were beginning their decade long war of national liberation. A century later in the 20th century, the Marine Corps captured the period as imperialism proudly in their hymn that celebrated their fighting from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. That was the Barbary Wars in Tripoli. The next step toward the annexation of Mexico was the work of white settlers. In January, 1823, Stephen F. Austin was indemnified by the nascent and poverty-stricken Independent Republic of Mexico with a land grant that his father had received from Spanish authorities. Austin, a slaver in Missouri, brought 300 other slaver families along with their human property to the Texas province of Mexico and began colonization of the region of the Brazos River in Southeast Texas. Austin employed 10 men initially to kill the indigenous residents who did not comply with being pushed out of their homelands. This marked the birth of the Texas Rangers created to kill Indians and Mexicans. Some 30,000 Anglo-Americans arrived during the 1820s and 1830s, many of them small farmers owning one or a few slaves, but with prospects for greater wealth in property in Texas. Mexico outlawed slavery in 1830 and banned further immigration to Texas. The Anglo-slavers ignored both laws. With skirmishes and battles starting in 1832 that became a war of Anglo-slaver secession from Mexico, the slavers and U.S. mercenaries like Davy Crockett suffered a humiliating defeat that ended with their retreat into a former Franciscan mission in San Antonio called the Alamo in February 1836. But the slavers declared in Despite the defeat, the slavers declared independence the following month, independence of Texas. Mexico did not recognize the self-styled Republic of Texas and tried to regain the territory without success. Following Texas illegal independence, the number of enslaved Africans soared and by the time of the Civil War, they made up one third of the Texas Anglo population and the main source of wealth. President James Polk, revealing his intentions to invade Mexico, sent the 3rd Infantry Regiment to Anglo controlled Corpus Christi in June of 1845. Then in December, with the agreement of the Anglo Texas illegal government 
the United States annexed Texas as a state of the United States, 28th state. Polk then moved the Third Army Infantry to the Rio Grande in February 1846, poised for the invasion in June. After nearly two years of brutal counterinsurgency attacks on resisting Mexican peasants, the U.S. Army regulars and volunteers, along with the Texas Rangers from land and the Marines from the sea, occupied Mexico City for two months of brutal rape and mayhem, forcing Mexican officials to sign away half their territory, creating the unstable and fraught U.S.-Mexico border of today. It is essential to understand that United States aggressive white nationalism and settler colonialism form the bedrock of US institutions and historical and continuing white nationalism, a culture of violence, a, a gun culture, a militaristic culture, and that genocidal policy toward indigenous nations and descendants of enslaved, slave, enslaved Africans as well as Mexicans and Chinese, always looms inside the US and has been extended globally by genocidal US policies, military occupations in Pacific, the Caribbean, Central America, and Asia. In the process, the United States created millions of impoverished refugees. This is not just history, rather the present reality at the US-Mexico border, and of course in the Middle East as well. But during the Civil War, the Union Army carried out a forced march and four-year incarceration of the Navajo people, resulting in the death of half their po population. During the same time, the Dakota nation was forced by the Union Army out of their homeland in Minnesota to make, make, uh, make it safe for the white Scandinavian settlers they had invited to live there. While unarmed Northern Cheyenne refugees were massacred in their res reservation at Sand Creek in Colorado. So the Indian Wars didn't miss a beat during the Civil War. And while it raged, a Abraham Lincoln did not forget his free soiler base who brought him to that high office. Free soil meant taking native land free of chattel slavery for white commercial farmers. They were raising crash crops. These were not subsistent farmers. There were no subsistent farmers except native people, like Lincoln's family who could not afford to purchase enslaved bodies. Congress at Lincoln's behest passed the Homestead Act in 1862, as well as the Morrill Act, the latter transferring large tracts of indigenous land to the states to establish land grant universities. The Pacific Railroad Act provided private companies with nearly 200 million acres of indigenous land without treaty. With these massive land grabs, the US government broke multiple treaties with indigenous nations whose people were still living there. It would take genocidal military force to evict them. Most of the Western territories, including Colorado, North and South Dakota, Montana, Washington, Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona were delayed in achieving statehood because indigenous nations resisted appropriation of their lands and outnumbered the settlers until they didn't. As industrialization quickened, land is a commodity real estate remained the basis of the US economy and capital accumulation. The federal land grants to the railroad barons carved out of indigenous territories were not limited to the width 
of the railroad tracks, but rather formed a checkerboard of square mile sections stretching for hundreds of miles on both sides of the right of way. This land, the railroads were free to sell to settlers in parcels for the railroad, the railroad uh, owners own profit. The 1863, 64 federal banking acts mandated a national currency, chartered banks and permitted the government to guarantee bonds. As war profiteers, financiers, and industrials such as John D. Rockefeller, Andrew Carnegie, and J.P. Morgan used these laws to amass wealth in the East, Leland Stanford, Collis P. Huntington, Mark Hopkins, and Charles Crocker in the West grew rich from building railroads with cheap Chinese indentured labor and Irish labor and Eastern capital on land granted by the United States government. After the Civil War, six of the seven divisions of the US Army were stationed west of the Mississippi, where they carried on genocidal wars against the Plains and Southwestern indigenous nations, including the intentional extermination of tens of millions of bison. These troops were pulled out of the South where they were supposed to be occupying the defeated former Confederate states to allow for land distribution to former slaves and democratic elections for their political participation. But without sufficient troops, the Ku Klux Klan made reconstruction impossible, imposing a reign of terror and restoration of the ex-Confederate elite very few of whom were ever punished. This is important not only for understanding how settler colonialism defines the United States and all of its institutions, but also as African scholar Mahmoud Mandani has documented, all of the defining institutions of settler colonialism as practiced in the 19th, 20th and 21st century were first developed in North America, in the United States. The US tribal homeland was a pro prototype, not only for the South African reserve under apartheid, but also the Nazi concentration camp. The Wild West originated in the Northwest Territory, east of the Mississippi, not west of the Mississippi, Defining the West as the site of genocidal conquest erases the origins at the very founding of the United States, intent on building world power based on land theft, genocide, and slavery, the pillars of the US fiscal military state. Criticizing US historians for their erasure of indigenous peoples is foundational to comprehending US history Hamdani writes, engaging with a native question would require questioning the ethics and politics of the very constitution of the United States of America. It would require rethinking and reconsidering the very political project called the USA. Indeed, it would call into question the self-proclaimed anti-colonial identity of the US. Highlighting the colonial nature of the American political project would require a shift in the understanding of America. One necessary to think through both America's place in the world and the task of political reform for future generations. Furthermore, Mandami argues regarding the conflation of immigration and settlement Immigrants join existing polities, whereas settlers create new ones. If Europeans in the United States had been immigrants, they would have joined the existing indigenous societies in the new world. Instead, they destroyed those societies and built a new one that was reinforced by later ways of settlement. 
So the nation of immigrants rhetoric that avoids the dynamics of settler colonialism plays a role that is essential to settler colonial nation state projects as the United States and Israel. The political project of the settler to create and fortify the colonial nation state becomes obscured by the non-political project of the immigrant who merely seeks to take advantage of what the state offers, allows every citizen. Historian Lorenzo Versini also distinguishes between settlers and immigrants, asserting that settlers are unique migrants made by conquest, not by immigration. Settlers are founders of political orders and carry their sovereignty with them, whereas immigrants face a political order that is already constituted. Immigrants can certainly be individually co-opted <clears throat> within settler colonial societies and often are, but they do not enjoy inherent rights and are characterized by a defining lack of sovereign entitlement. Immigrants and refugees to the United States do not have the option to resist becoming, do, they do have the option to resist becoming settlers. Although in most cases, they do not know the history of the United States or the political reality. The United States Immigration and Naturalization Service policies based on exclusion make the new immigrants life precarious, particularly for immigrants of color entering a racial order that renders them suspect already. So may, they may not want to know the reality or that they have a choice and that by default, they become settlers. East Indian immigrant uh, Suketa Mehta in his Immigrant Manifesto, writes of immigrants of color, they are here because you were there. European colonialism and US military invasions, coups, occupations, all out wars, have made their lands inhabitable. What Meta writes is the case of the tens of thousands unaccompanied children that Central American families have sent to the US border to save their lives from the chaos left behind by US wars and interventions in the 1980s and a US supported coup to oust an uncorrupt reform president in Honduras in 2009. And of course, it was the case of millions of displaced refugees from the US war in Vietnam. As Viet, Viet Nguyen writes, while not all war stories involve immigrants and while war stories do not scar all immigrants, a vast territory exists where war story and immigrant, immigrant story overlap. Nothing structurally will change in the United States to create an equitable economy and social order and an end to US military interventions until there is a reckoning with US history and return of land to native nations enabling their self-determination as nations. Even social justice and workers' mobilizations will not succeed without that prerequisite. Young immigrants from Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Pacific have a key role to play in that reckoning. Thank you. Thank you so much for that moving and uh, deep analysis, deep historical analysis of where we are today. I think uh, many of us, there are 150 participants all, uh, listening, will have many questions for you. Uh, we will proceed by having asking our attendees to raise their hands if they have a question. We can make you bring your picture up. Dr. Dumbartis would love to see the people who have been listening and uh, interact with you directly. But if you prefer, you may also write your question 
um, in, I guess it's called a chat, it's a QA. and a um, And our uh, moderator, Ziad Bouchlagen, will uh, 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 put you in the queue and bring you up either by reading your question or by, uh, by you know, bringing your picture up and having you uh, pose your question very directly to the speaker. So um, I think we have a, at least one question already in the q and I don't know if we have some more hands raised yet. Zied, are you there and ready to moderate? So we have questions that can make it so that it can be answered live, but uh, you should be able to okay. see them now under the Q&A. Okay, good. All right. Um, so, um, Okay, so should should I just read out a couple of the questions? I've got one from Daphne. Daphne, I don't know whether you would like to answer, ask it live, but I'll read it out for the moment. Could you explain who took control of the Mexican nation state when separated from the Spanish empire? Who controlled the Mexican government when the US claimed half its land? And what characterizes the current relationship between the Mexican government and the majority population? Um, well, uh, yeah, well, you know, um, Santa Ana, of course, who fought at the, uh, uh, fought Texas, remained, uh, he head of, um, head of state for a long time, also, uh, a general. Um, Mexico is a, you know, a former colony, almost 300 years of colonialism. And a um, a colonial subject um, of of the United States uh, since founding uh, its founding Mexico's founding was it exactly exactly the time when they became independent um, so it's been a uh, a chaotic and terrible history of uh, United States uh, economic dominance and uh, Mexico as a um, as a surplus labor um, a country seen as simply uh, producing labor uh, to have no power whatsoever um, the Bracero program and other indentured, indentured programs and um, then rarely uh, uh, legalizing the presence of Mexicans, even in their own former territory. Uh, so it's, um, I think it's less important. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of people who study um, Mexican politics uh, throughout its history, and I did too in graduate school, but uh, I don't think it's relevant to, um, or any other, uh, internal workings of uh, of uh, colonized in colonized situations. These are there are a lot of things Mexico do could do if it had any uh, you know real sovereignty in relation to the United States. For one, they could go to the World Court and challenge the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that actually created the um, uh, the uh, annexation. Of Mexico, it was signed with guns at the hands of the signers. That is not a legal treaty. They could also go and uh, challenge the Channel Islands, which aren't even a part of the treaty. It's simply, they have not the power to do that. The United States would actually boycott it, just like they did when Nicaragua uh, took the United States to the World Court uh, for bombing uh, their harbor. Uh, clearly an international war crime on uh, the United States didn't participate. So Nicaragua got a default decision for for them, but they couldn't implement it. And of course the United States went ahead and overthrew the <laughs> regime electorally. So we have to, you know, in the United States, we have to keep keep our focus on what the United States does and not try to rationalize it by the, uh, uh, by the problems uh, in, the, in the states that is being persecuted. Um, 
U.S. imperialism is still uh, dominant. It's going anywhere unless the people of the United States um, bring it down. Great. I believe we have a raised hand. Uh, Ziad, can you bring uh, that speaker online? Hello? They should be able to unmute now. Okay. Um, so this is the uh, question from Jam on the Sand Presents. Um, who's asking whether you have some PowerPoints or slides that we can read and thank you for the opportunity. No, my mentor was Vine Deloria Jr. and he ordered all of us, all his mentors never ever to use um, uh, visuals in giving a talk. And why is that? I'm interested no. as an instructor who uses <laughs> photos and images. I, I never, I, I use videos, I show, I mean, that's okay. But it's, a, you know, you need to, we need to um, engage directly with, by voice. That's, that's really the native uh, way that I was, I was taught. Um, so you don't have any escape valves. <laughs> from the truth. Right. Ah, well, there you go. Yes, I mean, and, and particularly in an age of the digitized image that can be manipulated, uh, that's doubly true, I imagine. All right, we have several more questions, so I'll just go ahead and read them. Um, uh, Caroline Lagosa asks, how do you believe the U.S. occupation of the Philippines throughout the 1900s, and particularly following World War II, led to the instability of current President Rodrigo Duterte's reign. Many Filipinos believe that the US occupation greatly helped them industrialize and democratize. So how do we recognize, reconcile this modernization with the negative implications of US occupation that are still emerging today, such as Duterte's war on drugs, unstable democracy, corruption, and so on? Yeah. the. Um... You know, this was the, uh, once the United States uh, had the co uh, continent um, sealed, um, it took right off, you know, the same generals who were um, fighting the Lakotas in, uh, uh, in the Northern Plains uh, were sent to the Philippines. Uh, they called them in Indios, they called them uh, they used all the same terminology of Indian hating. Um, it was a brutal, what they did, what the United States did at every stage in, uh, you know, in, the, in, the first, in that occupation was they interrupted, uh, just as they did in Mexico, they interrupted a national liberation process, an anti-colonial, decolonial process. Um, France didn't succeed in doing that with Haiti. Haiti, you know, was, but they've tried to persecute Haiti ever since for it. Uh, but there was a revolutionary movement going on in the Philippines that would have overthrown, was close to overthrowing uh, the Spanish uh, long-term occupation. So the Philippines is in, you know, suffered two um, occupations um, brutal, uh, that, that they were, uh, that the United States, um, came in and this is a, this is a form, uh, a practice of European imperialism. This is what Cortes did in Mexico with 500, um, well, highly armored soldiers with, you know, with, uh, uh, human eating uh, huge pre uh, presso canario dogs and armored horses um, against bamboo uh, bamboo arrows. Um, they conquered, you know, the the lar the largest city in the world at the time and destroyed it, Tenochtitlan. Tenochtitlan, and they did that by allying with because the um, the Nahuatl speaking uh, Aztec Mexica, Mexica uh, had 
come to dominate uh, people all, you know, all over in greater Mexico. So they allied themselves with these, uh, these liberation movements um, to go in and, you know, and overthrow. Um, so that, those were the foot soldiers were the native people. And this is, the, this is how European colonialism works. And it often taps into the elites, like in India, and create a middleman, the Raj. Uh, so in the Philippines, they interrupted and uh, claimed to be throwing Spain out. There was this sense of a possible alliance because Filipino people didn't know anything about the United States, who they were, what, what they were about. Um, so they probably, you know, in some cases welcomed um, any help they could get. But of course it was then this long-term counterinsurgency against the Philippine revolution. Uh, and then the, the brutal occupation up until after World War I, World War II. Um, so that's a long, long period of colonialism for any people. Um, I, I don't think you can ever talk about good and bad imperialism, good and bad colonialism. Um, if there are a few droplets of, of positive uh, innovations or, or whatever, um, it, it doesn't, it, it simply doesn't, uh, um, there's no balance possible. Um, the you, you know the United States has pretty well controlled uh, Filipino politics since the end of the occupation. Of course, the Marcos dictatorship. It took decades of resistance to get rid of Marcos, and so Duarte is simply a. Um, I'm sure he's not the choice that the United States would have made, but he's certainly better than. Um, <clears throat> he cooperates very well with the special forces who have never left. They've never left militarily. The United States has never left the Philippines. They did close the base, um, you know, the huge base, but they've had special forces there ever since. And they're fighting the Moros, you know, they're fighting the, um, the uh, um, people who, who deserve, really deserve autonomy or independence. Um, and of course, with the 9-11 and the anti-Muslim hysteria, uh, the motives being Muslims uh, makes it a, you know, now, they're now fighting terrorists, right? So Duarte is cooperating completely, you know, with, um, with the thing that the United States cares most about is not having any really um, liberated power bases exist in the Philippines. And of course, they lose the brain, the um, brain drain from the Philippines, you know, with uh, um, the um, special status of former colonials like Puerto Rico and, and the Philippines. Um, well, Puerto Rico is still a colony. They um, come to the United States, so there's a brain drain. There's a drain of um, of human. Uh, uh, they're like Mexico. Their main income comes from remittances from foreign workers who are exported to work, um, sometimes almost in, uh, in slave-like conditions in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and these places and are terribly abused and many, many are women as well. And of course, all our health workers in the United States uh, uh, this drain on, on the Philippines, you know, of having uh, having these skilled people away. So um, it's a, you know, it's a, so I think, you know, I, I, I think there's no, no doubt about it that, that colonialism keeps reproducing corrupt, uh, corrupt leaders in foreign colonies as long as the United States keeps um, any kind of liberation uh, and people's real desires for self-determination um, impossible to achieve. Thank you. Our next question is from Paul Wapner. 
Can you talk about any white resistance? Oh, sorry, there's just uh, to the early genocide of Indians. How loud were the alternative voices and what happened to them? Well, I know that now and then US historians are constantly looking for, and especially, I don't know, especially left historians are looking for some, you know, white person who sided with the native people. Um, I am not convinced by it. I, I think of people like Frederick Douglass who, who uh, demeaned and uh, um, uh, insulted native people, uh, really Indian hating um, people you would think. Uh, there have been what developed the friends of the Indians that developed in uh, upstate New York, uh, elite group of people who um, was more like um, charity, you know, the sense of, oh, the poor, um, you know, the, there are two kinds of stereotypes of, of Native people. One is the, uh, is the violent uh, killer, scalper, um, bloodthirsty, savage. And the other is the, you know, is the poor, miserable, helpless, um, drunk um, uh, uh, Indian who, who, who's sympathetic, you know, there's, so charity usually revolves around that. Um, so actually accepting native self-determination and liberation, I don't believe there was ever a single um, white settler that had that attitude. If so, they would have had to have gone to live. And, you know, during the colonial period, Massachusetts, especially well documented, is that there are many, many cases of, um, there used to be, it's sort of like, you know, you think about Israel and Palestine exchanging, exchanging captives every now and then. Um, the Indians took captives, the United States took captives, and in a you know compromise, when they're trying to settle something, they would exchange captives. That almost always the, the white people who were captured by native people did not want to go back, did not want to leave. And um, this was true even you know in the West and the Southwest, uh, Apaches. There's a wonderful new film I recommend, um, News of the World, that takes place of the, the genocide of the Kiowa, and, uh, mainly by the Texas Rangers in, in Texas. But it's right after the Civil War. And it, it's a really amazing thing, a Tom Hanks movie. And the, the story revolves around a young German immigrant uh, uh, girl whose whole family um, she, her family, her, her German family, the immigrant family were killed by the Kiowas uh, in, you know, in, uh, in, in their resistance. And they took her captive and raised her. So she's completely, she's this blue eyed blonde little, you know, like 11 year old girl. And um, so Tom Hanks is given the role, you know, the, uh, the um, job of, uh, going and, uh, uh, oh, and then her, her people are wiped out by the Texas Rangers, they're, they're killed. And um, she's an orphan and she's loose and to go find her and take her back to an uncle and aunt who live in the, uh, uh, in, the uh, 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 in the hill country of, of uh, Texas. So he goes on this journey and and so that she, she's completely Kiowa. She speaks only Kiowa, blue-eyed blonde. And it's based on a true story. So there are true stories of this. And she didn't want, not want to leave. She wanted to be uh, with her people, but of course she had no, no family anymore. And the Kiowas were being herded into a reservation in Oklahoma. And, uh, there shows scenes of them being, you know, their trek of, of defeat. Uh, it's a really powerful, powerful movie. But those are the only situations is when 
a white person is inside the native culture and sees um, what it is and becomes a part of it, then generally they, uh, they don't want to leave. So there were some of those, but then they had no status whatsoever with the US uh, or, you know, or colonial or US settlers. Uh, they were considered um, evil. Uh, they were considered just Indians, you know, and treated like Indians. So as far as solidarity goes, I don't think it really existed until the 1960s. You really see, you see it in the 50s with the Native Civil Rights Movement and, um, and the um, Black Civil Rights Movement. Um, definitely, and in the uh, Poor People's Campaign, uh, Martin Luther King died before it finished, but um, there was a very large Native contingent that when they marched to the, um, to lay their, you know, their uh, demands before the uh, state, uh, the, the capital, uh, they put uh, the Native delegation in the front uh, of that march. So that kind of solidarity came with the 60s, what I call the 60s revolution, which really started with the 50s civil rights movement. And, um, and ever since then, there's been uh, plenty of, of, of solidarity, but I, I don't think it existed until then. I might jump in here unfairly. There are several more questions to ask, but perhaps if you would, um, you know, treat me to a brief answer. As a fellow historian, I think a lot about what to do to raise uh, consciousness. And one of the strategies always is, oh, let's find that minority that was woke in the past, right? Mm -hmm. And I can see where Paul Wapner's question is coming from. How do you see this moment, you know, as uh, building on maybe that, that opening for solidarity in the 60s? And how do we get to and what would it look like to um, enact some kind of reparations. Uh, you mentioned during your talk, the possibility of returning land, for example. Could you expand on that a little bit on how we as scholars can as well, uh, you know, help connect those dots and see that policy through? Yeah, I think um, um, reparations for slavery for this to descendants of enslaved people who still suffer the consequences definitely of, of that horrific experience um, is an absolute, you know, absolutely an important demand. Mostly Native people um, don't ask for, actually reparations are offered all the time. The Black Hills were taken by um, uh, completely illegally uh, occupied. It was no treaty whatsoever. It's their the Cheyenne and, and Lakota and other native people there, their sacred land. And they built the Mount Rushmore, the horrible Theodore Roosevelt did, um, that horrible monstrosity in the middle of it. Uh, but in 1980, the US Supreme Court made a decision. If you read it, it's just the most scathing uh, criticism of, the, uh, of how it was taken illegally and it goes on and on and on. And then they offer, a hundred million dollars um, uh, to settle it. And, and so the, the native people refused that. They still haven't taken that. That is now like $5 billion in trust that these are the poorest people in the whole hemisphere in, in South Dakota, Pine Ridge. That's the hardcore there. That's where the Wounded Knee Uprising happened. And of course the Wounded Knee Massacre and they absolutely refuse to take that money. They want the Black Hills back. So land back is the main um, call of Native people, a very simple <laughs> demand, land back. All of the federal land that was taken, uh, the National Forest Service, the BLM land, the National Park Service, uh, fisheries and you know the US Corps of Engineers, none of that land was taken by treaty. It was simply appropriated by the federal government. Um, they don't ask that 
you know, that any private, you know, private property that people have that that be given back, even though a lot of it was taken illegally. Whole cities are built on land like Salamanca, New York, uh, Palm Springs, California, uh, um, Tucson, Arizona, uh, where they pay rent today. They made settlements because native people took it to court and they pay rent to the appropriate native people. Um, there's also, um, was pretty strong in the seventies. It sort of died out, but I think it, it's a good, a good demand, um, not demand, but a, you know, an idea that people who um, own land that clearly, and this is you know, so much uh, uh, unsettled property in, in New Mexico, for instance. Uh, so this is where, you know, where it mainly came from, that uh, they, um, that they, in their wills, you know, the people who live there, instead of uh, willing it to their children or offspring or selling it, uh, that they return it to the appropriate native Pueblo, the Pueblo Indians in New Mexico, and start re rebuilding uh, their land base because it's so narrowed down. They can't really grow. People have to leave for jobs and all because they can't really do nation building on such small uh, parts of land. But land is the land is the main demand. Yeah. And not to be considered a race. Native people are not a race. It's not about racism. There is Indian hating, but it's not the same as, and of course, race itself. Everyone says all the time, race doesn't exist. It's a social construct. But on the other hand, it, you know, there's a, a lot of obsession with race. And I think what we should deal with is white supremacy and not talk so much about race or racism. That's a great segue into our next question. Uh, thanks a lot for this pr brilliant presentation. Do you have any advice for Asian and Asian American communities to fight against the current anti-Asian racism in action? There have been national marches and rallies for Asian lives. What may we next do to stop AAPI hate? Well, I think there's a great basis for <clears throat> a solidarity of native people and Asian people it already exists. Uh, Asian people are generally more in, you know, in, in cities where there are fewer native people, but there's a historical, you know, this, I have a whole chapter in, in, the, in the new book on, uh, it's actually the longest chapter in the book on Yellow Peril. So this, you know, anti-Chinese, um, or jealousy, I think, of, of China goes back uh, to, you know, early Christian Europe. Um, Marco Polo uh, in the med medieval period, 12, in the 1200s, uh, went and spent um, 17 years uh, traveling around China and came back horrified that these people are so developed. And, you know, almost everything we use today was, um, except you know the foodstuffs that Native Americans um, invented in the Western Hemisphere, the squash, potatoes, tomatoes, uh, beans, uh, practically everything um, that's eaten, um, but mostly everything technological originated in, in China. And so, you know, the, there was this, this certainty that China was going to invade. So there's, it's so deep in Europe, it, you know, transported to, to the United States. Um, but one of the things, uh, this Chickasaw scholar, Jody Bird, um, uh, her book, Transit of Empires, just, just the, uh, an amazing book, but she had this insight in her research. She found that a lot of the rhetoric was so similar between uh, anti-Asian and anti-Native American that about, uh, about the original presence of Native Americans, and of course they, they insist, uh, and it's really not true, there were many migrations 
back and forth, you know, in the Pacific and and um, especially the Pacific, maybe the Atlantic uh, native people were out in boats all the time. They were seafarers. They, um, so they, but they've frozen it. U.S. Uh, scholars into um, uh, a migration only over the Bering Straits, filling all the way to the Arctic Circle. It's the most absurd idea of uh, how populations move ever invented, <laughs> you know, as if people couldn't cross an ocean um, before Europeans uh, came about. So uh, that's a bogus theory, but it, it is their fear that, you know, that Jody Bird says there's a connection that Asian, the idea of being overwhelmed by Asians dates back to that, their own theory that Native Americans actually came from. So she thinks it is a form of Indian hating. She sees a lot of, of similarities of fear, you know, um, and so, it, it is, it, I live here in San Francisco, 40% uh, of the population is Chinese. I live in a Chinese neighborhood. Um, and it, you would think with 40% of the population, uh, there would be a lot of power, but actually uh, I would say a good many good percentage of these assaults and um, insults and assaults not just, you know, in the last year, although it's accelerated horribly, you know, with the whole COVID um, uh, source that is still, you know, perpetrated um, even now in the Biden administration talking about, oh, it probably originated in a lab, which immediately makes people think it's for the purpose of, you know, some kind of germ warfare. And so this idea of, of being dominated by, by um, uh, China, and yet, you know, these, there's very little political power. I mean, the, the representatives we do have who are Asian here in the city are among the best, Eric and Gordon Marr and others are just absolutely amazing. But um, yeah, I think, uh, uh, I was so, you know, I had just finished the book when the, um, when it got out of hand, I mean, it, it, of course, it was the Atlanta, the Atlanta massacre that I think um, really brought it to light. This is, you know, this even though the the kid um, refused to uh, admit he was anti Asian uh, or his deed was anti Asian that exotic, exoticizing of the Asian woman is also ancient, you know, in European minds. Um, and he, it's probably merged in his mind, sex and Asian, you know, they go together, woman. Um, so this, um, it's, it's really, really heartening to see the, um, but it's still juxtaposed. I had, um, Viet Nguyen, you know, made a, wrote a really, really important uh, piece in The Guardian where he says, as long as Biden and others keep pounding, you know, that China is, is the enemy, it's, you know, it's, it, that's, that's the source of, uh, of the yellow peril hysteria. And it, at the same time, he's leading the effort you know, to to do away with the bias, um, anti uh, anti Asian bias and the uh, violence, he's still mouthing this this absolutely untrue. There's nothing to it that China. Where are the China warships? You know, on our shores, I don't see them. The United States has warships packed in the South China Sea. It's just the opposite. So I think we have to speak out about that, you know, and not just, you know, the Wuhan flu thing or uh, 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 people, you know, individual, individuals who know it's, um, it's very easy to knock over 
you know, a, a small Asian elder uh, in the street and, and just, you know, it's a, a kind of a thuggery. That's small compared to this larger thing of perpetrating that idea that China is out to get us. You're exactly right that these linkages between domestic uh, violence and foreign policy are, are often ignored or um, erased in the public mind. I confronted that, you might, as you might imagine, in so many teach-ins after the 9-11 attacks, right? That, uh, uh, but what you encounter is the fact that many uh, citizens are not aware of what our foreign policy is. And that leads into a question from our co-sponsor, um, Malani Ranganathan, who is the head of our anti-racism center. Uh, that was such a brilliant talk, Dr. dunbar -Ortiz. You show so powerfully how the narrative of a nation of immigrants erases the genocide of indigenous peoples while simultaneously reframing American empire as quote unquote foreign policy. Can you reflect on why American foreign policy and international relations academics are so unwilling to confront the history of settler colonialism, white supremacy, and structural racism in the US, and how they divorce domestic racism from international empire building? Yeah, it's a big mystery. Um, I think, you know, younger scholars who are um, coming up, you know, it's not 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 so great in my my field history. There are a few, but um, I, I do think that that I see um, I see these connections being made. This isn't, you know, a very powerful, influential group, and they're, you know, they're they have to get jobs, they have to get tenure, you know, they have to publish, and this is where the gates come down, you know, and and discipline. Yeah, you can see younger scholars are very idealistic in graduate school, and then, well, they get less and less um, making these connections, and maybe they'll write, you know, uh, uh, you have to have your first peer-reviewed um, book in order to get tenure, and you know, in a, a major university, and there you come up against the editors at Oxford University Press or one of the university presses that, um, but you see more and more even um, in the publications from Duke and, and Harvard and, you know, prestigious uh, peer reviewed publications, uh, you see more and more of these connections being made. So I'm, I'm hopeful, but you know, there's, it's still, it's still such a, um, you know, such a slow process. Um, and we have, you know, all of this takes eons to dribble down into textbooks, you know, in, in grade school and middle school. My, my last book on indigenous people's history of the United States has been where I, I more or less the same thesis is laid out in, in, in you know, in that book as, as well. Um, it, the Young People's Edition has been absolutely embraced by librarians and teachers all over the country. I think teachers are really hungry for, um, for uh, this point of view. You know, I get invited by teachers uh, uh, to, and, to, and students, you know, to talk about this. and. and and it's always well received. And sometimes I see the, you know, the his, historians in the back of the room, you know, not saying anything, you know, they're not, they're not changing. Um, that book, uh, which won awards and has sold, I don't know, it's in the 25th printing or something. And it's just now, you know, was adapted, uh, was used for this, uh, this HBO series on um, white supremacy and colonialism um, that um, that book was not reviewed by a single historical journal you know in my field not a single one not even you know those little bitty um, 
reviews, <laughs> just lists of books, nothing <laughs> except the native, you know, the native journals and um, uh, some black journal, you know, others that are peer reviewed, but are not the, you know, the um, Journal of American History or the American Historian or the Western Histor History Quarterly. You know, these, the New England History Quarterly. These are the prestigious journals um, that are required reading and, and nothing, you know. So it was, there was no criticism, but there was no, it was just uh, ig ignoring it. Um, but it has been picked up by teachers and in college and universities and all. And I think, I think I have, I mean, I understand that I have nothing to lose. I'm retired. I'm a professor emeritus. And, um, but I do, you know, and I sympathize with, uh, I chose very young myself to not teach in a, in a research university, but uh, to teach in a working class um, uh, state college where I taught my entire career, California State University, uh, East Bay. And um, so, which has, you know, has a few graduate programs in nursing and, and computer science, uh, criminal justice, but it's undergraduate uh, working class students, uh, very diverse. Um, and give my, you know, whatever knowledge I had directly to people like who who are like I grew up, you know, working class, and um, and I I decided to do that. Sometimes I regretted it because once you get there, you hardly ever get out of it. You know, it's no longer a choice. It's a, you're you're no longer material, uh, you know, for the research university. So, but you know, as I look back, I'm really grateful to my younger idealistic self that I I did that. And I, I actually encourage others to think about doing that. You know, it's about half the salary and no, no private office and no travel money or anything. Uh, but um, it's, you know, it, it's really worth it to, to actually teach and, um, and uh, uh, you know, be, um, you have a, a, a great deal more freedom. Uh, from all of the ambitious, you know, the, the things you have to do too. But it's important at the higher level too. I see, um, I see people, you know, I, I have a couple of friends in the Harvard history department and I'm just amazed at some of the stuff they're doing and the graduate students that are coming out. So I think even, uh, and of course, American university. And, and so I'm very hopeful, but, but it is really hard to craft the, um, the, the origin narrative of the United States. It's such a, you know, the idea that the United States was, uh, was a colony of Britain that was, um, you know, a national liberation movement called a revolution. It should not be called a revolution. You know, it really should not. It's a secession, a secession. Uh, of the same people from their country. That's not a revolution. <laughs> and Irish immigrants, you know, who are nationalists, um, really, you know, I, uh, the chapter is a heartbreaking chapter on the uh, Irish refugees uh, who came because they, you know, the nationalists were encouraging also Irish immigration to the United States because they really believed that the United States was an anti-colonial state. And it never has been anti-colonial. It was the greatest enemy of the Haitian Revolution or even the French Revolution, you know, for that matter. Um, I mean, the, all of the restrictive alien and sedition, all it was all about, you know, French revolutionaries coming in. So it's so rooted in the, um, I did want to mention when I was describing the um, original settlers uh, from which I come, you know, the, the Scots-Irish settlers in particular, um, that the, not all 
clearly not me. <laughs> um, but most of the white nationalists you see today are descendants of settlers. There, there are some descendants of, of immigrants, maybe even some immigrants among them, but I think they're wannabes. You know, they're wannabe original settlers types. Um, so I think that the, the, the character aspects of the settler is you can see this, this sense that they have total liberty. Liberty originally meant owning property, but liberty also, you know, has come to be symbolized with guns, you know, the right to bear arms. And that that is there. I've heard them say, I know some of them, some of them are in my family. They actually say that the Second Amendment is the only thing they have left as white people, the, the, you know, the white genocide, and they have to be fully armed in order to prevent that genocide of white people. So it is, you know, if we don't know our history, we cannot understand, you know, what's going on right now. Wow, um, thank you for going over time. We're at 226. I'm wondering if you have time for one more question. We have one yeah. attendee who has had her hand up for huh. almost half an hour now. Rosemary Lee, I don't know if you're there, but Zied, could you um, see if Rosemary would like to pose her question on camera? Possible? Everyone's shy. Uh, no, okay, talking permitted. Rosemary, do you want to just say, speak your question if you don't want to come on camera? That's fine if I'm on camera. Oh, good, oh, welcome. <laughs> oh, I know Rosemary, hi, Rosemary. Hi, Roxanne. <laughs> uh, we don't see you yet, but go she, ahead and she'll uh, be on in a second. Um, okay. Excellent. Rosemary's one of those teachers. Oh, wonderful. Yes, I've often thought of doing the NEH programs, uh, you know, linking academics with high school teachers. I don't know whether Rosemary had benefited from that, but I'd love to hear. Uh, what are you doing? Okay. Zied, is Rosemary going to link up? She should have access now, uh, both video and audio. Okay, Rosemary, welcome. Welcome. Um, I have a question that's more about the future. I mean, given that we ha are in a stage of transnational capitalism where we have more wealth and a more of a division of wealth ever in history um, and this incredible global uh, effect. I mean, what are or what can be the kinds of global coalitions and alliances that can be built up by people who are being deprived of the all the necessities of life in, ter in terms of water, the atmosphere, billions of climate refugees, uh, you know, and as well as refugees from wars and invasions and just basically genocide with, with um, not just the uh, pandemic, but just an inability to uh, support themselves. And this is a, 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 you know, a global response to this absolute destruction of everything that we need to survive. And this long history of worldwide migration, which is always, and movement, which has always been part of our history as a species. Well, yeah, it's, it can be overwhelming to, you know, even think about how, how this is going to, to change. And I think too many people have given up, you know, and think, well, it's, you know, it, uh, going to end with the U.S. just falling apart on its own. And I, I don't see that prospect at all. Um, but, you know, the, the, um, the global, we've really seen it with the pandemic. If anything should have brought uh, the whole world together interlinked with a common cause, um, it should have been a, a pandemic that threatened every every human life 
Um, and we've seen the, the Western European, the rich countries, the United States, um, you know, uh, absolutely uh, without any sense of, um, of solidarity. Uh, even today, um, you know, the vaccine nationalism, uh, I think it's now 30 or 40 countries in the world have not even seen a single vial of vaccine. Um, it's, and, and there was, you know, if the, if the demands don't come from movements, social movements, it, they don't happen. And there was no social movement. Um, there is no social movement in solidarity with, um, uh, with other people who, who are suffering. It seems like we have developed a real deficit even on the left in the United States of, um, of um, seeing ourselves in a, you know, in a, a global context. Uh, this was so important in the 1960s, 70s, uh, you know, opposing the, the Central American uh, interventions in the 80s. Um, and I, I think, you know, it's, um, uh, for one, uh, the, the destruction of actually existing socialism, uh, flawed as it was, uh, took away the, um, an anchor that kept the United States in, in check somewhat. And there's just nothing, nothing there now uh, that prevents this, you know, total greed and individualism, um, which, you know, which um, filters down into the population, you know, every man for himself. Uh, it's, uh, no one's gonna help you out. And although it, different levels. I mean, there's no way the Mexican people, Chinese people here in my own neighborhood would survive without their internal solidarity and mutual aid. But at a, at a higher level, you know, in the country, it's very, but I do think that, that, um, that we keep spinning. It's almost like uh, being an eternal quicksand uh, without sinking completely in in not knowing what we're doing, who the enemy is, how how to you know how to develop a strategy that actually um, actually has uh, longevity instead of uh, flaring and then and then uh, dying. Um, and that is, you know, I think unless we, we, um, uh, we reckon with U.S. history and what the United States is, and I, I don't really see that, you know, happening. Um, even, you know, even with the demonstrations last summer, they, they beautifully set off an international, a global response. Um, against, you know, violent authority, police, but also deeper about colonialism uh, in Britain and France and Belgium, you know, that, and it just died down. There's no mechanism for following up, you know, no organizational mechanism for, for, for keeping that, building upon that. Uh, everything just, you know, uh, goes back to, um, uh, not to the status quo before, but, um, uh, you know, some progress is made, but not really uh, developing it further. So I do think that, that, you know, it's not like it takes a lot of mental time to simply come to accept what the United States is on the part of people who have no, um, no real material, um, investment in, you know, in the uh, patriotic origin story. And I don't know, I think we, we should start with, you know, as, as far as policy goes, uh, pick up on Ron Dellum's uh, 
uh, uh, transfer amendment, you know, of transferring military funds to social services and de, uh, defunding the military. This is, you know, there's, um, there's absolutely, once they build these, you know, they have to build these things, they then they have to use them to build more. The, in, the military industrial complex that um, hardly gets talked about at all. And to do that, we also have to attack uh, the um, content of US patriotism. And no one is doing that better than military veterans, you know, of Iraq and Afghanistan right now, and the old Vietnam veterans and veterans for peace. So I think supporting, um, supporting these organizations and really giving them a platform. They are the ones that can uh, bring consciousness to people about, um, about the military. They really have studied it, they know it. And yet I, I don't see that uh, uh, happening and, uh, you know, in, our, in our social movements, centering um, anti-militarism. I don't think it really came up at all. Um, the border guards came up last year and the, you know, but really they sort of left the army, the Navy, the Air Force, special forces and the Marines alone uh, in terms of uh, who has the guns uh, and is killing people. Um, so, well, that would be my long answer. Uh, Oh, thank you so much. Um, I, we still, I, we're going to have to leave some questions on the table, some very good ones about unraveling federal versus state laws and so on, but uh, it is well past 2.30 and we've imposed on your time. Yang, would you like to say a couple words uh, of closure? I, I just thank you for this wonderful talk and uh, the Q&A is also very good. I, I learned a lot. I, I teach empire and imperialism in SIS and uh, uh, somehow link the American colonialism to, uh, you know, domestically speaking and international one uh, in some of those uh, discussions. So I really learned a lot from, from your talk. So thank you again for thank you so much. joining this conversation. Okay. Thank you. And, and, uh, I'll just remind everyone, if you can, if, you, if, you, uh, if your uh, interest has been piqued by today's talk, to tune in tomorrow for Exterminate All the Brutes and for another take on this uh, rethinking of that American origin story. Um, and one, uh, maybe as a final note, I will mention a very, very important exchange that was published in the American Historical Review critiquing Jill Lepore's very well-written, beautiful synthesis, These Truths, but which nonetheless left out all of the pre-1776 story um, and the ways in which that origin story uh, steers us in a very, uh, well, let's just say, um, uh, fanciful and uh, imperialist direction and away from uh, understanding the roots of, uh, of white power and the enduring structural imbalance in our country and around the globe. So um, those of you who are still with us, I hope you'll raise your hands or give a, a, a clap for our speaker. And thank you so much for joining us and starting a conversation I hope will continue here at American University. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Thank Have a you good all. afternoon. Bye. Goodbye. Bye -bye.